What follows may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. The world is full of stories. Stories of mysteries. Of curiosities. Of oddities. Join Cat and Jethro Gilligan Toth for the strange, the bizarre, the unexpected as they lift the lid and cautiously peer inside the box of oddities. I think one of the first things we need to do is invest in a new chair for me because uh, this one makes way too much noise. <laughs> um, yes, I vote yes. We've got so many expenses already. <sighs> It's the cost of doing business, I guess. It's a, it's a good thing that we don't pay our bills. Um, so here's the thing. This is the first podcast that we've ever done. Yes. And we're pretty excited about it. We uh, we hope that you will be too. We're guessing that if you're here listening to us, and you know, obviously you are, you share some of the same interests. Yeah, we like weird stuff. Really weird stuff. And, and in fact, uh, that's what kind of attracted us to each other. We've been married now for uh, a couple of years. And Kat's weirdness is what attracted me. The first time that I realized that she was weird was when she told me that uh, when she was younger and she had guests over, she kept uh, what she called a poop chart and uh, required all of her guests to, to fill it out. She was tracking her guests' bowel movements. I didn't realize we were going to discuss this. Yeah, well, you know, there were prizes involved. It's not like it was just for fun. <laughs> what kind of prizes? It was just uh, things that I found yeah. about. Around the house? Know. Yeah. Bathroom related? Like right. here's an old plunger? No. No, actual prizes. There wow. was One was a, a statue of a T-Rex mm-hmm. uh, that was like a gold lame. It was really nice. Yeah, you know, various things. It, it doesn't matter. Let's move on. Um, there are a lot of things that interest us. The Box of Oddities, we're going to cover a lot of different uh, topics and subjects from just strange and weird things to uh, macabre to just uh, what the... Right, yes. Medical oddities. Uh, We'll talk about interesting things in the seas because they're big. And we're so excited that yeah. that you can join us. For yeah, that. we're very excited about yeah. that. I mean, and we're we're talking about the stuff anyway. So each week we're going to each choose a story independently mm-hmm. of each other. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what you're going to talk about. You don't know what I'm going to talk about. Mm-hmm. We uh, will spontaneously share that. And that's it. That's what we'll do. So uh, I think the first order of business is deciding who's going to go first. That's a good question. How do you want to decide? Do you have a coin? We could flip a coin. I don't have a coin. I don't have a coin either because um, this is the first podcast and we make no money on it. <laughs> no coins. Send us a coin. I have a werewolf book. Okay. I can toss it and then if it lands on the front with this lovely werewolf mm-hmm. facing up, then uh, you go first. Okay. And if it lands with the backside, which has the author's face, which has slightly more hair, mm-hmm. um, then I'll go first. Fair enough. Okay, ready? Toss the werewolf book. Here we go. Oh, you go first. I go first. All right. I'm going to talk about the head of Lee Harvey Oswald. (gasps) Oh, that's so exciting. Lee Harvey Oswald's head. I don't know if you realize this or not, but uh, there's still a bit of a conspiracy swirling about uh, whether or not Lee Harvey Oswald is actually who is in Lee Harvey Oswald's grave. They exhumed him in 1981 and determined officially that it was Lee Harvey Oswald. It's my birthday. I was born in 81. Just saying, it's a special year. It was a special special, year. Special year. Okay. They dug up Lee Harvey Oswald and you were born. Please continue. They officially determined that it was Lee Harvey Oswald, but there are so many questions that are still swirling about that um, I thought we would take a moment and relive the day they dug him up. Cool. All right. Well, you you know, Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy and then he himself was assassinated. Allegedly. On on the 24th (laughs) of November in 1963. A guy named Michael Eddowes wrote a book in the mid 70s called The Oswald File. In it, he argued that a Soviet imposter took the place of Lee Harvey Oswald when Oswald was in Russia and then came to the United States where he assassinated Kennedy, and was subsequently buried in Oswald's grave. 
Uh, Eddowes asserted that uh, there were differences between Oswald and the autopsy of the assassin that was per- performed by the Dallas medical examiner. I think his name was uh, Rose, Earl Rose. Uh, he pointed out that Oswald was five foot eleven in height, according to his U.S. Marine records, mm-hmm. and that the Dallas pathologist said the assassin was only five nine. Mm-hmm. In the book, he went on to cite several other differences. Um, the corpse also had a, a large scar on the wrist, and Addo's claimed that Oswald had no such scar. Uh, he also pointed out that as a child, Oswald had uh, a mastoid operation, which left him with a depression in the flesh behind one of his ears about the size of a dime. What's a mastoid? According to Wikipedia, the mastoid part of the temporal bone is the back part of the temporal bone. Uh, its rough service gives attachment to various muscles oh. and has an opening for the transmission of blood vessels. Okay. There you okay. go. So now you're learning about anatomy. I feel as well. so good about myself right now. Yep. Okay. He claimed the corpse of the man that Jack Ruby killed had no such depression in his skull. So Eddowes sought action in Texas courts to exhume the body of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, there was all kinds of. Um, Uh, resistance to that, mostly from Oswald's older brother, Robert, who uh, said, no, we're we're not going to do that. But he prevailed uh, with the help of Oswald's uh, widow, Marina. Oh, so Oswald's uh, Oswald's Marina. (laughs) That sounds like a lovely place to fish. Um, (laughs) Oswald's ex was like, let's do this. Yeah, well, she was, um, I guess, haunted by a visit that she received in 1964 from a bunch of government agents. They just kind of showed up with a stack of cemetery papers and said, here, sign all this. And she couldn't speak or read English very well because she was from Russia. Right. And so she became convinced that her late husband's remains had been disturbed somehow. She thought maybe that they had been dug up and moved. Uh, She grew pretty suspicious that uh, he was not in the grave, that the grave was empty. Oh, wow. So they contacted the medical examiner at the time. Actually, it was uh, the assistant medical examiner in Dallas whose name was Linda Horton. She was intrigued with this theory that it actually could have been Oswald's double. As am I, Linda. She said, I feel it's in the best public interest to conduct the exhumation. And this was according to the Dallas uh, Morning News. Mm -hmm. Quote, if there's any question and a reasonable question that science can resolve, then it is our business. Now, when Oswald was first pronounced dead, an autopsy was done. They did a craniotomy. They cut the top of his head off. Mm -hmm. Medical examiner Vincent DeMaio, who was involved in uh, the Oswald autopsy, wrote a book called Morgue, A Life and Death. And in it, he talks about uh, what they did uh, with Lee Harvey Oswald after he was pronounced dead. According to the book, Earl Rose, who was the Dallas County medical examiner at the time, Mm -hmm. saw it open uh, Oswald's skull to find a completely normal brain. Nothing unusual. He didn't see anything there. Uh, Of course, you know, the the bullet wound had kind of tore up his insides. And uh, they uh, they did a quick autopsy. Then they put all of his uh, vital organs in a plastic bag. His bits? Yep. They tucked his bits in his abdominal cavity before sending him off to be prepared for Mm. burial. Like a mom packing a lunch. Mm -hmm. Yep, here we go. Okay, (laughs) wow, I got Oreos. Uh, At the funeral home, Miller Funeral Home in nearby Fort Worth, uh, the undertaker, whose name was Paul. Paul Grudy, and he's an important guy okay. in this story. He didn't waste any time. He got right at it. He was concerned, and he, he thought probably in the future they would they would exhume his body for some reason, sure. Oswald's body. So he gave Oswald's body a double dose of embalming fluid to keep him fresh. Fresh. Then he dressed him uh, with uh, clothes off the uh, funeral home rack. They have, like, stuff. Sure. He, Lost uh, and found items. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, he put white boxers patterned with little green diamonds on Oswald, some dark socks, a light shirt, a thin black tie, and I guess, a, like, a cheap brown suit. And, and then he was, he, they charged uh, Oswald's family $48 for that. I can't just go giving that stuff away. No. So fast forward to uh, 1981, October 4th. Now, this is according, once again, to Vincent DeMaio from his book, Morgue, A Life and Death. 
He said, uh, before the sun rose on October 4th, we stood by the killer's grave, an unseasonably muggy morning, and we dug up Lee Harvey Oswald. Or somebody. Just to be sure America had buried the right man back in 1963. Now, here's how he described it. He said the vault was cracked, which allowed water to seep in. The casket inside was rotting, was brittle, and was splotched with uh, mildew Mm. and stains The handles that were metal were badly corroded. Part of the lid over the cadaver's upper body had caved in. He said that at that point they could look inside and see that there was somebody inside. Somebody? Don't you want somebody to love? Oh, that's gross. Uh, The decaying lid of Oswald's casket, uh, they said, was likely damaged by the gravediggers removing the cracked vault when they pulled it up out of the ground. Mm Mm-hmm. Likely, but not for sure, right? They're they're not. Well, they don't know. Mm -hmm. As they opened it, uh, the smell of moldy dirt and mildewed wood and rotting flesh emanated from the box uh, in like uh, like a cloud that just kind of pushed people back. Sure, as it will. Forensic pathologist uh, couldn't ignore that, and uh, some of the civilians that were nearby backed off. The casket, the inside of it was just, uh, it was a mess. I mean, it, it. it had been less than 20 years, but still because it had been so badly damaged. Oh, sure. I left a lawn chair out over the winter last year, and it was just, it was gross. We had to throw it away. That could be a whole new podcast, Lawn Furniture Autopsies. <laughs> Patio wear gone awry. <laughs> the uh, the muscles in the legs were, were long gone. His skin was just like kind of like parchment and shriveled around the bones. Mm-hmm. He was mostly skeletal. But they didn't really need the whole body. They just needed the head for identification purposes because they were going to check with his, uh, his marine dental records. Mm-hmm. Again, quoting from his, his book, he said, With a scalpel, I sever, severed several rotting muscles and uh, dried tendons in the shriveled neck and detached the skull from the spine at the second cervical interspace, the upper neck. Um, and with very little force, just kind of pulled the head from the backbone. Um, snipped an embalmer's wire that held the corpse's mouth closed for the funeral, and the jaw came off in his hand. So then they run the tests. They send it, send out his uh, his dental records, or they send out his, his head, mm-hmm. essentially, and compare them with uh, the dental records. And the um, medical examiner, Linda Norton, said, quote, the findings of the team are as follows. We independently... And as a team have concluded beyond any doubt, and I mean beyond any doubt, that the individual buried under the name of Lee Harvey Oswald in Rose Hill Cemetery is in fact Lee Harvey Oswald. At this point in time, we hope this puts the matter to rest without any further speculation being raised as to the identity of the individual in Rose Garden or Rose Hill. Uh, you think that would put, put an end to it, right? But no! No, there's people like you. There's people like me (laughs) and Paul Grudy, the mortician who actually prepared the body. Mm -hmm. In the A&E special, The Men Who Killed Kennedy, uh, Paul Grudy was interviewed. And he said uh, at the time of the burial, he personally put Lee Harvey Oswald in a steel-reinforced concrete vault. The vault was then hermetically sealed, guaranteed not to break or crack or go to pieces It was heavy concrete and steel with an asphalt lining. It was designed to keep the uh, coffin. So it's unlikely that the damage that they discovered when they exhumed him was just like, oh, it's, you know, worms. Yeah, no. Worms and stuff. He said uh, when he opened the grave in 81, they found that the vault had been broken and the bottom of the vault was the part that was broken. The top was still intact. It was broken on the bottom. And so his theory is that somebody came in, dug him up, tried to lift the vault out of the ground with like a whatever they use at, uh, you know, graveyards for moving stuff. Sure. One of those uh, truck, yeah, truck right. metal truck mouths. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like that. Well, yeah. And so when they lifted it up, the weight of it collapsed, the bottom of it. And uh, then the casket was damaged in the process when they put it all back in. He said, as they removed the body from the casket, you know, whatever body it was, Mm -hmm. he said that he did recognize the clothing that he had put on the body. He said that was the body that he put in there. But the head was not the same head. He said it had been removed from the casket and from the body uh, so that they could take pictures of it. But when he looked at it, there was no craniotomy 
Oh, there was no mark from where they had cut off the top of his head? Yeah, was, the, the skull was complete. It had not been autopsied. Interesting. Now, when an autopsy is done like this, the skull is cut in order to remove the cap in order to take the brain out. And in the autopsy, they do have the weight of the brain. They did take his brain out. And in order to do that, they had to take the top of his skull off. Right. But in looking at the skull they dug up from his grave, the skull was was whole. It had not been cut apart or autopsied in any way. He said, knowing that he had handled the body originally, and there had been an autopsy on the head, and now there was no autopsy on the head, in his mind, he said it was pretty clear that something had uh, transpired that had caused this. Well, yeah. Dead head skin doesn't just go back together. It doesn't grow back together. No. I'm not a scientist, but I will attest to the fact that I, I do not believe dead head skin grows back together. <laughs> this is what he thinks happened, according to his interview in uh, the A&E special, The Men Who Killed Kennedy. And again, this is the guy who prepared the body. Right. He said, I feel as though someone had gone to the cemetery off hours, taken the head of the real Lee Harvey Oswald that was now dead. And, uh, you know, how they got it, he he says, I don't know. But uh, they, they went to the cemetery and using a tripod lifting device, tried to pull the vault out of the grave and in the process the bottom of the vault fell breaking the cemetery or breaking the vault causing the casket to deteriorate to a degree that they found it and then uh, they you know removed um, the the head that was in there and replaced it with Lee Harvey Oswald's real head so that they would find the teeth of Lee Harvey Oswald he said that's my theory this is what i think happened uh, whoever caused that is the same faction that caused the assassin- assassination in the first place. In my mind, oh. a cover-up has taken place. Sure. So even though the official word still is, yeah, that was Lee Harvey Oswald's body, um, there are many people that say there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Now, one of the uh, guys, the medical examiners that was there, says that, as I mentioned earlier, he actually cut the head away from the body. This guy says it was um, it was not attached to the body. So there's a discrepancy there. Sure, that doesn't make any sense. But what uh, really doesn't make any sense is why it was obvious that um, they did an autopsy on his skull in 1963 mm-hmm. when he was assassinated. Why in 1981 the skull was whole and complete and had not been cut open? Plus markedly shorter? Maybe that was the discrepancy in the height. You know, they thought he was 5'11", he was 5'9". It was the two inches they took off the top. That's probably it. Yeah. If that's not weird enough. <laughs> now, that's a bad haircut. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Ooh, yeah, take a little off the top, please. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> to make things even weirder, the funeral home, once the autopsy was complete, they put the remains in a new coffin and reburied it in the same plot at Rose Hill Cemetery in Dallas. The old coffin was supposed to be destroyed. But it wasn't. Of course not. Somebody put it up for auction in 2010. Wait, in 2010? Yep, in 2010. They held on to it from 1981 through 2010. The funeral home did. Baumgartner's funeral home did. And uh, put it up for auction. The ad is still up on the uh, Nate D. Sanders auction site. I'm going to read a little bit of a of a uh, excerpt from that. The original deteriorated coffin offered here measures 80 inches by 24 inches deep with a thickness of the sides of the casket approximately one inch sitting on wood crate, which measures 84 by 24, accompanied by a letter of authenticity by funeral director Alan Baumgartner, who assisted in the original embalming of Lee Harvey Oswald and later purchased the Miller Funeral Home along with all of its property. And then underneath it says, this item sold in 2010 for $87,468. Now, Lee Harvey Oswald's brother Robert was pissed, <laughs> as you can well imagine. <laughs> sure. Because he had told him, okay, fine, you can dig up my brother, but if you put him back in a new coffin, the other one needs to be destroyed. Right, and they he said, was the one who originally didn't want him right. exhumed in the first place. Right. Right, okay. And so they said, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. But they didn't do it. They, they just oh. they held on to it. All those years and then and then sold it. <laughs> 29 years. 29 oh, I years. I probably forgot. Yeah, by now. Yeah. I'm sure nobody will remember. 
So anyway, Robert Oswald, Lee's brother, took it to court. The judge ordered Baumgartner to pay Oswald damages of $87,468, the amount a buyer had agreed to pay for the decaying coffin in the autumn of 2010. And then he got the remains of the coffin back as well, and it is assumed that those remains have been destroyed. Now, in the process of researching this, I found an article by a guy who's a rare book dealer and author. His name is uh, Stephen J. Gertz. And there's a picture of him with the coffin. He didn't buy it, but he was allowed in to see it. Mm-hmm. I guess he knew people or whatever. He said something to the effect that this is the, uh, the rotting remains of Lee Harvey Oswald's coffin. And then underneath it says, on Saturday, December 11th, 2010, I took a nap in it. <laughs> he actually got in it and took a nap. In Lee Harvey Oswald's I don't believe it. decaying coffin, he said, <laughs> it, it's fragile, it's funky and foul inside. I really didn't have time to consider where I was or how I felt beyond feeling that this was uh, the perfect rotten crate to hold the Oswald remains for eternity. I just wanted to get out. Okay, well, sure. But what made you want to get in it in the first place? <laughs> That's the question, sir. Mm. Now, I just uh, searched that auction site and I did not find the coffin listing, but I did find a uh, M41A pulse rifle signed by the cast of Aliens. Really? How much is that? <laughs> so, okay. Bring me the head of Lee Harvey Oswald. That was weird. Yeah, you know, I, I'd always thought that that had been pretty much rectified, that it was, in fact, Lee Harvey Oswald, that they, you know, because of the statement from the, the um, medical examiner saying beyond a shadow of a doubt. But no, there's still some shadows and some doubts. There's some very <laughs> shadowy doubts here. This is the Box of Oddities. I said box. So now it's time for the thing in the middle. Yeah, the the thing in the middle where we do a thing in the middle Mm. between my story and your story or your story and my story, depending upon uh, who goes first. Right. So we don't really have a name for it. No. So we're just going to call it the thing in the middle. Well, I don't know. Well, we're going to do. That's what we're calling it for today, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Here are five weird facts really quick. Number five, the longest time between two twins being born is 87 days. Number four, female kangaroos have three vaginas. Number three, the oldest condoms ever found date back to 1640. They were found in a cesspit at Dudley Castle and were made from uh, animal and fish intestines. Number two, the first man to urinate on the moon was Buzz Aldrin. And number one, in 1567, the man said to have the longest beard in the world died after he tripped over his beard running away from a fire. Yeah, so a reminder, don't forget, if you are uh, enjoying the Box of Oddities, like and subscribe and all that business. And again, it's uh, theboxofoddities.com. Find us on Instagram also and on Twitter. And Facebook. All right, your turn. Your turn. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm still looking at the gun from the Aliens <laughs> sure. movie. Well, who could blame you for that? Okay. So it's interesting because, of course, Russian spies came up with your story. Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, Russia's a big thing right now. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Yeah. You think it's subliminal? Uh, that, maybe it is. Yeah? Because uh, my story also has a bit of a Russian spy tinge to it really i'm going to talk today about the somerton man Ooh, dish it girl <laughs> oh no Mm-mm. what i can't say dish it girl no. okay no. december 1st 1948 on somerton beach does that mean that you won't fill out my poop chart what no you fill out your own poop chart oh. you don't listen Go ahead. You don't listen to me. Shh. Go ahead. Just south of Adelaide, South Australia, a man was found dead on the beach. He was laying back with his head resting against the seawall, with his legs extended and his feet crossed. Do you know the story? You know the story of the Somerton man? I've I've heard bits and pieces about this, but I, I I'm not really sure what the uh, the details are. Just that they don't know where he came from or something. Right. Okay. So an autopsy was conducted, and the pathologist estimated that the time of death was around 2 a.m. December 1st. Uh, The autopsy failed, though, to find the cause of death, noted that the man was in his 40s with a very fit physique. Coroner's assistant said the man possessed strong and high calf muscles like that of a dancer. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) 
He sus- Hold me closer. <laughs> he suspected that the man had been poisoned or had killed himself, but couldn't find any real evidence for this theory. The one thing that they did find was that uh, in his tum tum, one of the things that was in there uh, that remained was uh, a pasty. So he had had uh, a some- stripper. No. What? It's Australia. A oh. pastry. Oh. A delicious I flaky you baked good. I you said a pasty. It was. They call that's, it a pasty in Australia. Well, that could be confusing. Well, for you. <laughs> go to go to a, no. a dance club and women have got like pick em ups <laughs> on their nipples. Oh, the raspberry cream in those. Mm. I love them. So, but no one in town knew who this dude was. Uh, no one recognized him. Several people who had walked by the beach noted that they had seen him on the beach in that same position, but they didn't know he was dead or if he was dead. One uh, couple did note that there were a lot of mosquitoes and he didn't seem to be bothered by them, <laughs> which, you It's know. one of the advantages of being a bloated corpse. So about a month later, uh, let's see, January 14th, 1949, staff at the Adelaide Railway Station discovered a brown suitcase with its label removed, which had been checked into the station cloakroom on November 30th. And they believed that the suitcase was owned by the man found on the beach. In the case was a red checked dressing gown, a size seven uh, red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pajamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs and some tools. All the labels had been removed from his clothing. There were some dry cleaning notes in there, but they were really inconsistent and didn't seem to make any sense. Like either the dry cleaner didn't know how to consistently label his items or someone had just falsified dry cleaning records, which seems (laughs) like a a lot of trouble in Australia. (laughs) So a coroner's inquest into the death commenced a few days later, but um, it was adjourned. Until months later, for some reason, the investigating pathologist re-examined the body and made a number of new discoveries. Uh, It noted that the man's shoes were remarkably clean and appeared to have been recently polished, which seems weird for a guy that had been just wandering around a beach town. Did he wash up? Was was there water in his lungs? No. He, He just looked like he was taking a nap on the beach. Exactly. Okay. The uh, evidence fitted in with the theory that the mi- the body might have been brought to Somerton Beach after the man's death and set up against the seawall, but that didn't exactly make sense with rigor mortis and all of that business. But the pathologist was kind of confused because there wasn't any poison, but the way that he was found dead made them think that it might have been poison. Eh, It was real confusing for them. So it was right around this time, months later, uh, that a tiny piece of rolled up paper was found in the fob pocket sewn within the dead man's trousers. So the fob pocket, that's that that's, little tiny pocket. Right. It's a little pocket that doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense right. at all. So in, harkens back to the days of yore. Right. When people had fobs. <laughs> so it um it was not only inside the fob pocket, it was sewn inside the fob pocket. Really? Which is fun to say, fob pocket, fob pocket, fob pocket. Um and on that tiny piece of paper rolled up were the words Tamam Shud. And that comes from the last page of a rare poetry book called the Rubaiyat. In July, not long after this, a businessman told the cops that around the time of the man's death, he found a copy of the Rubaiyat in the backseat of his car. Someone had tossed it through the open window. And yes, the two uh, words of the last page, the Taman Shud, had been raggedly ripped out. Somebody's sewing poetry into his pants? Exactly. That's so weird. It's romantic, isn't it? It is romantic. You never sew poetry into my pants anymore. You never asked me to. <laughs> More intriguing, though, were the uh, scribblings, uh, which I then wrote codes, question mark. Codes such as W-R-G-O-A-B-A-B-D, uh, W-T-P-I-M-B-A-N-E-T-P. And so on and so forth. Maybe they're uh, just really bad um, vanity plates. You think so? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know much about Australian vanity plates, but now that doesn't make any sense because none of them end with so and so's mom. <laughs> <sighs> Boompa and Mimi. 
<laughs> Dan's girl. And then, uh, in addition to the codes, <laughs> was a phone number. Um, the phone number uh, led police less than a five minute walk from the dead man's body where he had been found to the doorstep of a young woman. And she told police that she was married. However, recent investigations revealed that she was not married until 1950. She also told police that she was nurse, although new findings show that she had not completed her nursing training. And uh, she was invited to take a look at the bust of the man that had been molded before he was buried. Oh, okay. I thought you meant like his chest size. And now we're back to the pasties again. Man, you keep going back to those nipples. What's your point? Depends on how cold it is in here. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you need to stop with that. No more. So the woman checked out the bust and apparently, according to uh, the police, nearly fainted when she saw it but claimed she didn't know who the man was. And, really? And police were like, okay, cool, I guess. And then they ceased further inquiry. And They just let her walk out? And, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Also, they agreed for some reason not to release her identity to the public, um, which is very strange. But in 2013, her daughter came forward on a television documentary, and her real identity, Jessica Jo Thompson, was uh, public. She was generally known as Jess Harkins, and then after 1947 as Jo Thompson, which seems interesting to me. But you know, whatever. I don't make. I don't <laughs> judge people mm-hmm. based on their uh, incredibly frequent name changes. Anyway, police had asked Joe whether she had given away a rubaiyette recently, the, the poetry book. Right. Because they wanted to find connections here. And she indeed had given away a rubaiyette recently. But then when they tracked it down, the recipient turned out to be alive and well, and his book was intact. That's so weird. So it trans- What does all this mean? It transpired. I don't know. Transpired that Joe Thompson's son, Robin McMahon, ended up becoming a professional ballet dancer. He had extraordinarily strong calves, apparently. Also compelling is that he and the Somerton man share a rare dental trait. They both have their canine teeth next to their central teeth rather than uh, one more out here. You here. can't talk about your teeth uh-huh. without touching them, I've noticed. I'm just showing you. That's another thing I love about you. Moreover... <laughs> there's a rare feature of the ear shape that both men share. In, in 2011, students from Australia's University of Adelaide took to the case of the Semerton man and a man named Daniel Abbott, who is a biomedical engineer at the university, studied the mystery for seven years. They worked on trying to decode the letters that were scribbled inside the rubaiyette and uh, found a few bits that might have led to an eventual code, but it didn't pan out. Um, He said that DNA is the key to solving the mystery, and DNA did come into play. Uh, They were able to find that much of the DNA from, like, the mid-east coast of America was shared with part of Robin's DNA. So the the son of sketchy name changer McGee nurse had similar DNA to uh, what would have been found in in America on the East Coast. Okay, but she claimed not to have any connection to East Coast Americans. You know, so, so there's people that believe that he was um, an American soldier uh, stationed in Adelaide. Here's also something interesting. This student from Australia's University of Adelaide went to interview Rachel, uh, the supposed granddaughter of the Somerton man, and uh, then they fell in love and got married, which I think is so sweet. He's solving a mystery, and she solved a mystery in his heart. Oh. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's really creepy. So so there are many theories uh, regarding the Somerton Man. So they haven't solved this. They have not solved it. It's okay. still a mystery. They don't know who he is or or what the significance of the Taman shoot is. Um, there are ideas that he might have been a Russian spy, mm. um, which has really ebbed and flowed 
no, what's the word? Ebbed and what's the ebbed and waned? Waned and ebbed. Wa- eb- waxed, waxed and, and waned. Ebbed and flowed. Ebbed and it ebbed and waned it in popularity, <laughs> based on you know the time and and what our uh, situation is with Russia at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's seeming less and less likely now with the connection to America, though. Uh, the Somerton man has never been formally linked with sketchy Joe name changer. So it, it's still a mystery. But they think it, he possibly could have been a uh, a spy of some sort. And that makes sense. I uh, did want to mention that uh, much of my research for this came from Newsweek, Wikipedia, The Guardian, and allthatisinteresting.com. You know, I I think he's a time traveler. You think so? Yeah, he just kind of uh, dropped into our dimension by mistake, kind of uh, wandered through a a vortex somewhere Mm -hmm. and uh, found himself on a beach in Australia and decided, time to take a nap. And then he was mugged by a beachcomber. That's what I think happened. Interesting. But there was enough time in between for him to sew poetry in his pants. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, um, not only the Russian spy connection between our stories, but napping in unusual places. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a common theme. Oh, it all comes together. <laughs> so beautiful. Well, that was fun. Yay. Yeah. Good story. Thank you. I like it. I, I'm incredibly interested by the Summerton Man, and there's so much information everywhere. And uh, it, it's one of those things where you could keep pulling and keep pulling and keep pulling, and it doesn't matter because nothing's confirmed. And how many years has this been? Uh, it was He was found in 1948. And it's been all these years, and they still yeah. have no idea. I mean, I would tell you how many years, but I'd have to do math. And Who has time for that? You know, and the ironic thing is that my dad is a math professor. Did you say the erotic thing? Did I say that? It's weird. That would Freudian. be weird that that I would think that my dad as a math professor is is er- er- well, erotic. I think it's sexy, but you know. <laughs> that's because numbers turn you on. <laughs> you are you are really strange when it comes. That's another weird thing about you that oh, I good. really like. I'm glad is, that we're just listing off yeah, weird things about me. You'll get your chance <laughs> to list off the weird things about me, but uh cat loves numbers so much but only certain patterns of numbers she whenever she's pumping gas she has to pump gas only to a palindrome it's like oh ten dollars and five cents worth of gas that's not a palindrome at all what is that that's nothing that's just one zero zero five. Oh, one zero zero one. I meant, yeah, ten dollars and one cent. I see that on our credit cards all the time. <laughs> ten dollars one cent. Right, but it, then again, I am also very lazy, so I'll more often than not have someone else pump my gas. In which case, they will not pump it to a palindrome. Yeah, and you have to get out and correct their their pumping. <laughs> I would never do that. As I said, I'm very lazy. <laughs> Well, that's it for the show. I don't know how we're going to end this. Oh, I don't have to have a thing. You yeah. Know, you just, well, thank you for joining us. We had fun. We hope you did, too. And so, let it be known that the box of oddities belongs to you, and its fate is in your hands. Therefore, it's been requested by those of whom I report to to beseech you for assistance. The box of oddities is free. We ask but one thing of you to provide a five-star rating and a positive review. True, that is two things. However, tis merely a five-star rating and a positive review. Also, subscribe to us. Okay, so three things is all we ask. Three things and three things only. Henceforth, the Box of Oddities commits to the telling of stories. Stories of the strange, the bizarre, the unexpected. We wish to offer our deeply felt gratitude and appreciation for your patronage. TheBoxOfOddities.com On Facebook at Facebook.com slash Box of Oddities Podcast. On Twitter at Box of Oddities. And Instagram at Box of Oddities Podcast. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved.